I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. And this is Currents. How one woman against all odds carried her troubled pregnancy to term. A lot of the times I think I would go through this all over again. All of the heartache, all of the pain. A Ministry of the Skies honors Bishop DiMarzio's work on the ground. It's nice to accept the sauna from them. And a writer tells us how his life with the saints took him on a unique journey. And I brought the um, 50 pages to a friend of mine and I said, here's my beautiful book. And he looked at it and said, this is ridiculous. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us this Friday. Well, we've been talking about it all month and tonight we wrap up our coverage of Respect Life Month. And we start tonight's coverage with a very powerful tale. Our Natalia Ortiz joins us now. She's got the story of a woman who fought for her life and for that of her unborn child. Natalia. Pregnancy is the most vulnerable stage in a woman's life and it's a moment she should be protected the most. But for the woman you're about to see, simply surviving was nothing short of a miracle, which in turn brought about a blessing. It's an incredible feeling. It's almost like um, a feeling of disbelief. Is this, is this my child? This is my child. Sarah Webb's child is two-year-old Violet. She was born in April of 2007, but Sarah's pregnancy was a difficult one, one another woman might have chosen to terminate. She discovered she was carrying Violet while in the midst of an abusive relationship, but Sarah didn't have an abortion. Instead, she fled the state where they lived in order to save her life as well as the life of her child. Even though my parents were supportive, um, he, my husband at the time, he knew where they lived and I knew that that was not a safe place to go. So Sarah moved to a city where she knew no one. Even though she had a steady job and money in a savings account, she was rejected repeatedly for an apartment. If you choose life, then you're, and then you're looking for an apartment or a place to go to. Um, no one wants a single pregnant woman to move in. No one wants to be a landlord to a single pregnant woman. They want to know when they're guaranteed that next rent. Sarah had exhausted all her options, or so she thought. And she had just learned of her pregnancy and so um, wondering what to do. And so when I met her, I just kind of knew right away, you know, she'd be perfect for our maternity home. So I set up an interview and she was accepted, you know, hands down. Sisters of Life is a religious community in the U.S. dedicated to the protection of all human life. One of their missions is to provide support to pregnant women so that they don't choose abortion. We were founded in 1991 by John Cardinal O'Connor, and he really just had a vision. The vision was to end abortion through prayer and fasting, but the sisters are an active as well as a contemplative order, and they encouraged women to see themselves as heroes. They, they just really felt like if we were making this decision to choose life, that we were walking in, in Mary's path that Mary was also a single woman at that time and she was going through a difficult time and she was not exactly looked upon favorably. And um, so they really felt like we were an image of Mary in a sense. The sisters too were Marian-like. They nurtured Sarah, comforting her during the most vulnerable time in her life. Every day that I'd come home, they'd, I'd ring the doorbell and they'd say, Sarah, you're home. Welcome home. We're so glad you're here. Sarah stayed with the sisters until Violet's birth. A month later, she found a place to live with a friend who moved into town. But she's never forgotten the help she received from the Sisters of Life. What do you have to say to the Sisters of Life right now? Uh, <laughs> that's a difficult question. I owe them everything. I owe them my life. Um, we're the reason that um, we survived this. They're the reason. And Sarah believes the tough times were well worth it. A lot of the times I think I would go through this all over again. All of it. <laughs> all of the heartache, all of the pain, all the suffering, all the loneliness. I'd go through it all again. <laughs> because the end result is so beautiful and so amazing. It's, I'm in such a better place now than I ever was before and I'm much more enriched. 
and fulfilled in life. Because Sarah still fears her ex-husband may come after her, we could not reveal where the story took place. We can report, however, that the Sisters of Life are located throughout the country. For more information on the Sisters of Life, go to www.currentsny.net and click on Writing the Wave. Well, it's an amazing story. Uh, Natalia, thank you for bringing that to oh, us please. because I tell you, it's mm -hmm. she's gone through a very difficult period of her yeah. life and it's just great that these sisters were able to help. Yeah, and she really had exhausted all her options. She was telling me also that she sought help from a women's shelter, but they turned her down as well. Mm -hmm. She only had two police reports on file instead of three, which is the required uh, amount. So really, wow. she was wow. she had no one at wow. this point. And, and she said she'd go through it all again. That's well, what I, I find amazing. Well, I was about to say that's yeah. sort of yeah. the silver lining thing is that, you know, sometimes what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. And, you know, in this case, she really was able to go into some kind hands and open arms. And, uh, you know, obviously the product with her uh, little daughter is, uh, is great. Yeah. Oh, she was beautiful. We all fell in love with her. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Natalia, thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Well, stay tuned. There's much more Currents coming up straight ahead. Now, when we return, we're not only heading into the home stretch of Respect Life Month, the 40 Days for Life campaign. Campaign also wraps up this weekend. We'll have that and the rest of the day's headlines when Currents returns. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Coming up later, from corporate life to religious life, an author tells his story. But first, let's look at the day's headlines. The group Democrats for Life says it has 40 congressmen who will vote against any health care bill that includes federal funding of abortion. The executive director of the group says pro-life Democrats want health care reform, but they cannot support taxpayer-funded abortion. The 40 Days for Life campaign wraps up this Sunday, and its national director says it's helped save at least 2,000 babies from being aborted over the last five years. The campaign's activities include holding prayer vigils outside abortion clinics. And for more about that, including information on how you could get involved, head over to our website, currentsny.net. Well, when it comes to religious involvement, a new study shows converts are front and center. A Pew Center analysis shows converts to a faith are more active in keeping the basic commitments of that faith than are non-converts. Among the analysis, 70% of converts say they pray daily, compared with 62% of non-converts. Iran's new ambassador to the Vatican submitted his credentials to Pope Benedict in a special ceremony yesterday. During the meeting, the Pope stressed the need for religious freedom in Iran. We get details from H2O News. Catholics have always been present in Iran from the first centuries of Christianity and have always been an integral part of the nation's life and culture. This is what Benedict XVI recalled in his speech to Ali Akbar Nasseri, new ambassador of the Islamic Republic of Iran, who was received in audience on October 29th. The Holy See, the Pope said, trusts the Iranian authorities to strengthen and guarantee Christians the freedom of professing their faith and of assuring the Catholic community conditions essential to its existence. Benedict XVI also underlined that Iran possesses imminent spiritual traditions and that this can be reason to hope for a greater openness and confident collaboration with the international community. Today, the Pope said we must sustain a new phase of international cooperation, more concretely rooted in humanitarian principles and in the effective assistance of those who suffer. Iran's 70 million strong population includes some 20,000 Catholics. Well, also yesterday, Pope Benedict stressed the importance of using new media to spread the gospel. The Pope said new media, such as social networking, isn't just a way of communicating, but it is also changing the way people think and interact. The Pope told the Pontifical Council for Social Communication that though the content of the gospel remains unchanged, the church must consistently be looking for new ways to spread the message. Well, here's a different way of spreading the message of the gospel. Very different, as a matter of fact. In Texas, a church is using Halloween to deliver a message of faith through something called the Fear Factory. Steve Stoller takes us inside. Creative, unusual, over the top. Just a few of the descriptions of the Fear Factory at Saxe's Park Lake Church. It's the brainchild of Pastor Max Kennedy. We're showing them that it is, you know, 
entertaining, but at the end there's a message of hope that you don't have to be bound by fear. 50 congregation members are the actors, preparing for three hours of nightly chills and thrills. I think it's cool. They built the set in the main sanctuary, forcing Sunday services to be moved outside to the parking lot. Patrons are exposed to a plethora of phobias, from arachnophobia to claustrophobia. At the end of the 40-minute guided tour, they come face to face with Satan. The visitors are then led through the gates of hell. At the end of the tour, visitors are met by an angel that delivers a message of faith. Do not be afraid. I have been sent by the King of Kings to rescue you. The church has received some feedback from people who say it's inappropriate for a church, but congregants disagree. Well, I mean, there are a lot of churches doing the fall festival thing. It just gives people another option. The pastor says everything in the Fear Factory is based on biblical teachings. They won't be the type that'll come to an Easter pageant. They won't be the kind that come to Christmas, a living Christmas tree. But there will be some that are intrigued with being scared around Halloween. One congregation member says it means even more than being scared straight is bringing the church community even closer together. That's Steve Stoller reporting. As I told you, it was different. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I could see it as community entertainment. I can see it as a way of bringing congregants together so that they can, you know, work on a team project, if you will. Yeah. But I don't know about the whole thing about being scared straight and getting, you know, feeling more faithful. I mean, that right. angel had a sword. Yeah. It was, <laughs> they need to work on their props. <laughs> the hopeful I, thing no at the end. Or anything. It's right. supposed to be like a dainty wand or something. It was like, oh, a you dainty. know, come to heaven and this I'm going to hurt this isn't, you. This isn't Glinda the Good Witch no. we're talking about. No. But uh, no, I'm, you know, I, I, I do I do kind of agree with you on that because it is, it's like, you know, you scare the dickens out of everybody mm -hmm. and uh, then say, well, here I am, I'm the good guy, but I've got a sword pointed yeah, in your face. Yeah, that, that part doesn't make any sense. They can it's, maybe it tweak it. It is a little different, but uh, anyway. some tweaking, That's in right. my opinion. All but right. tis the time of the year to be scared, let's just say that. I, I get scared by other stuff in real life every day. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned, there's more current straight ahead. Coming up, he's flying high. Bishop DiMarzio is among the honorees of Our Lady of the Skies. We'll tell you what it's all about. I think it really is fitting uh, that they would be honoring a bishop who is uh, so supportive of this ministry. Well, I'm going to the airport in just a bit because I yep. uh, am going to Florida for the weekend, but I'll be back on Monday. Very nice. And I'm already looking forward to that routine. You know, when you go to uh, fly somewhere, business or pleasure, there's always that routine that you have to go through at the airport. You don't like to fly. Who are you kidding? No, I don't like to <laughs> fly at all. You check in your luggage. Maybe you grab a bite to eat. You head through security, and then you wait to get on board. And, and you, you're scared to death <laughs> until, until you take off, and you're in the air, and you're fine. That's me anyway. But how about taking some quiet time to pray? Maybe that's something I need to do before I get mm -hmm. on board the plane. Well, at JFK, you can actually do that in a chapel with a unique name, Our Lady of the Skies. And at the chapel's annual luncheon yesterday in Howard Beach, Bishop DeMarzio was among three people honored for supporting Our Lady of the Skies ministry. Take a look. I'm always excited when I come to uh, uh, this luncheon in particular because uh, I've been part of the Catholic chapel for many years and uh, we support it wholeheartedly. Hundreds of people came together to support the mission of JFK International Airport's Lady of the Skies Chapel. Today, I think, is the coming together of the airport family, airlines, security people, benefactors, and all to support the, the work of the chapel, Our Lady of the Skies Chapel. The whole airport community uh, comes together to raise the funds that support this apostolate. Uh, much, much of the work is aimed at the employees of the airlines and of the airport, as well as visitors. The event, sponsored by the Catholic Guild, is held every year and honors people who support their work. I'm very excited and I feel very honored to be here to represent Air Canada and to be a part of the JFK community and the Our Lady of the Skies Chapel. The church does so much work for the airport, especially in times of crises. And Part of my responsibility is to develop plans for emergencies, and we know that the Catholic Church is an integral part of that. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio was also honored. 
Bishop Damasio has has been involved in immigration all of his priestly life in in different places. It's almost natural that he would be honored here. It's wonderful. I mean, I, I I've had a good relationship with the airport community, and uh, they really are. Um, very, very supportive, so it's nice to accept this honor from them. This is the first year that uh, they're going to be honoring a priest, and I think it really is fitting uh, that they would be honoring a bishop who is uh, so supportive of this ministry. And why is this particular chapel so important? We're all passengers, we're all wayfarers, we're all pilgrims on a road, and I think that uh, when we're traveling an airport, uh, we can get the experience. It can be really a spiritual experience. There are 50,000 employees here at Kennedy Airport. That's a lot of people, that's a big parish. So we try to service them as much as possible. Prior to being a priest, I was a New York City police officer, and uh, when I first arrived at the airport, I said, oh my God, it's like being on parade, being on parade duty on Fifth Avenue with so many people all the time. And that's really what it's like. The people here are angels. They take care of the people, you know, and they get the service is an act of love. They make their travel more comfortable and more reassuring. To have a place to come to pray, to be able to just put your concerns in the hands of God and Our Lady is a very, very important thing, and the chapel serves that function. Well, let's bring things back to the ground. Tomorrow, of course, is Halloween, and the day after that is All Saints Day. And to mark the occasion, we visited a couple of parishes in Queens, and we asked people, who is your favorite saint? St. Barbara. Because that's my saint, and she's the patron saint of auxiliary and war. And um, I come from a military family. We've always had a devotion to Saint Jude, and you know when times are tough. Mary Magdalene, Saint Mary. Well, because I read about her, and, she, and it said that she stayed with Jesus till he died. Saint Anthony. Okay. Why? Because okay. uh, I I ask for things, and somehow or another they they come through. So. You know, faith move mountains. St. Jude. St. Jude. St. Jude. St. the impossible, impossible. Okay. Because I've been through impossible things lately, and I got through. <laughs> St. Francis of Assisi. Um, I guess I liked him when I was a little kid, when I used to, like, when you're little, you like animals. And you're like, well, he's a, you know, he liked animals. Ignatius Loyola. Uh, I, I went to Jesuit school from elementary to college, and he was our patron saint. Saint Anne. Why? Uh, Why? That was the Blessed Mother's mother. In our family, since my grandma, since I was born actually, uh, she's been praying with the Virgin Mary and uh, we have over overcome so many challenges over the past by praying for her and with her as well. Oh, I like St. Jude, patron of helpless causes, but I consider myself. Uh, St. Gerard Magella. Why? Uh, because I prayed to him when I wanted to have another baby. Lucy, because that's my confirmation name. And St. Jude, because he's the help, helper of lost and hopeless cases, because I feel whenever I have trials that I need to overcome and there are hardships I have to face, I always pray to him. Whatever I do, I feel it is, 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 is God that is guiding me. So I feel very much like John the Baptist. We always uplift our, our saints. I mean, we, we, we live by our saints because, in a way, they have uh, paved the road for us. So we look back at their life and they... Uh, inspire us. Everybody's got their favorite saint. Who's your favorite saint? Uh, you know, it's funny. My, my namesake, St. Francis, I would have to say kind of like that guy yeah. did with the animals and everything because I always like the animals. I swear, though, my mom is a saint. I mean, she really is. So, I mean, she isn't, but she is. Yeah. Um, and so, in my book, I think she kind of you know, sort of takes over that category. For there you me. go. Well, there you go. That's a very nice, nice thing. I um, would have to. I would. I would always have said um, Saint Matthew, just because that's who I am mm -hmm. named after. Uh, Saint Matthew, one of the apostles, of course. Um, I think now, though, probably uh, someone who's moved way up on the list after learning more about him in recent weeks Damien. is Father Damien. I Saint, knew it. Saint Damien. I knew it. <laughs> well, someone who I mean really dedicated his life mm -hmm. to working with the outcasts. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, that really, really speaks to me in a, in a very profound way, so. Yeah, no, good, that's good. I knew you liked him. <laughs> Stay tuned when Kearns Returns. We'll have more on the Saints, and we'll meet someone who's written a best-selling book all about them. 
Coming up, he's walked with the Saints and sits down with us to talk about his journey. The more you read the lives of the Saints, the more you realize that we too are called to be like them. Well, finally tonight, we heard what parishioners at a couple of churches in Queens had to say about the Saints. But uh, now we're going to actually meet a man who's written a book about them. That book, My Life with the Saints, is considered by many to be a modern-day classic. Its author, James Martin, has been a Jesuit priest for 10 years, but before that, his life was much different. Earlier today, he talked to us about his journey to the priesthood and his life as a writer. Tonight, Father James Martin is our eyewitness. The more you read the lives of the saints, the more you realize that we too are called to be like them. As one scholar said, we long to be who they were. Most people think that priests come from uh, super religious backgrounds. I did not. My parents were Catholic, uh, but not super Catholic. When I was working at General Electric, uh, I started to realize that I was miserable, basically. And I was getting all these stomach problems, and I was working too hard, and really wanted a way out. And I turned on the television set and saw a documentary about Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk. And that got me thinking about uh, Merton and religious life and monastic life, which seemed very beautiful. Originally, the Jesuits uh, were just presented to me as one option. And I really did not know very much about the Jesuits at all. I had no idea what a Jesuit was. But the more I got to know about them, the more I liked the, the idea that you could be a priest and something else, or a brother and something else. So a priest and a writer, a priest and a, uh, an artist, a priest and a teacher. And that really appealed to me. I'm much happier. I'm 100 times happier uh, than I was when I was at GE. The life of a writer seems very exciting to people who aren't writing. Um, part of it is exciting. I mean, having books published and getting to talk about them and giving talks and things like that and getting letters from uh, readers. Part of it is very dull. I mean, a lot of it is sitting in front of a computer trying to figure out the right word. I really like it. I mean, I, I would write all day if I could, frankly. I'm, I'd be happy to write from now until, you know, kingdom come. It's very rewarding as a writer when you find that your, your books or your articles have brought people closer to Jesus. Um, and that's happened a lot. Not thanks to me, but thanks to the Holy Spirit. Um, particularly with this book on the saints, My Life with the Saints. My Life with the Saints started out uh, uh, as an exercise in pride. I was um, doing these kind of short poetic uh, reflections on the saints and I thought I'd write a page or two of each saint and uh, you know people would just fall over because they were so beautiful. And I brought the um, 50 pages to a friend of mine and I said, here's my beautiful book. And he looked at it and said, this is ridiculous. You can't just you know, sort of uh, dilate on the saints in a page or two, assuming people know their stories. You have to provide some context and, and you need to provide some structure. Since it's spoken Spanish and English. Uh, I'm professing my final vows on All Saints Day. Um, it was all providential. I had uh, called the Jesuit Provincial in New England, where I'm a, a member, and uh, he said the only day he could do it is November 1st. And I looked up on the calendar, I said, well, it's All Saints Day, so I definitely want to do it then. So it worked out very well. Okay. There's always regrets. I lament the fact that, you know, I can't have an intimate relationship with someone. I, I would like to have uh, my own house or apartment. Um, I'd like to call my own shots in terms of, you know, where I go and what I do. But I think what's key is, you know, what's your governing desire? What do you really feel like you're called to? And once you understand that, you can choose it uh, and then say, all right, I need to let go of some of the other possibilities. The goal of the Jesuits is to help souls. That's the, and everything for the greater glory of God. So I'm happy that, uh, that these words have helped at least a few souls. Well, Father James Martin there, our eyewitness, and he mentioned that he's taking his final vows this weekend, and to find out what that means, you can head over to our blog where we've written more about Father Martin. Just head over to CurrentsNY.net and click on Riding the Wave. It's so cool that you can do that as a Jesuit. You can, you know, sort of have this professional life and you can also have this priestly life. Right. And uh, he, obviously he's a smart guy. He's been out there, you know, uh, working in the corporate world and banging his head up against a wall basically and said, I need a haven and right. uh, this is what it's going to be for me and I can help people in the process with his books. Yeah, and he says it's made him a hundred times happier than he was before mm -hmm. when he worked in the corporate world. So that's definitely a good thing as well. And what a subject matter to, to mm -hmm. take on, you know? I mean, talk about the, uh, the the lives of saints 
definitely interesting and definitely a lot to tell and a lot of detail in there. So well, I mean, that anytime you, if you're a writer, right, uh, you are looking for interesting subject matter. You know, those kinds of biographies are very compelling. Oh, There's yeah. a reason why they became <laughs> saints. Right. They don't just have a normal, mundane kind of a life or story. <laughs> she went know? shopping for groceries <laughs> yeah, on Tuesday. No, no, none of that. Not so much. But you know, <laughs> he says though too. Sometimes he's just sitting there tapping away at the computer all day long, and the fact that he loves doing that, I think, is great that he can do what he loves. Absolutely. That's probably why he does it so well. That's it. Well, that is all for this edition of Currents. Remember, you can always watch us online. Just head over to CurrentsNY.net. And you can also follow us on Twitter as well. The address there, twitter.com slash CurrentsNY. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Thank you so much for watching. Have a happy Halloween, a safe one too, and uh, a wonderful All Saints Day and just a great weekend.